Okay, hello and welcome to another lecture of E 102 Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the frequency response, and we're going to just jump right in with a check your understanding question. So check your understanding. Uh, we've learned about Fourier transforms, and we talked about a couple examples like the rect function or the causal exponential in previous lectures. So in this lecture, uh, we're going to start by asking you, what is the Fourier transform of one? So remember that the Fourier transform equation is something like the following. You have capital F of j omega equals an integral transform of some function f of t. So to check your understanding, let f of t equal 1. And please go ahead and compute what the Fourier transform should be. Feel free to pause the video, compute this, and rejoin us when you're completed. OK, welcome back. So let's go ahead and answer this together. Answer. So in this particular case, the Fourier transform of j omega is going to equal the integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 times e to the minus j omega t dt. Now, if I look at this Fourier transform, uh, I can simply simplify it to integral minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus j omega t dt. So the Fourier transform of 1 simply boils down to integrating the complex exponential. Now, although this has a closed form solution, which I'll just write for convenience here, e to the minus j omega t over minus j omega, uh, although this has a closed form indefinite integral, if we evaluate it at these definite limits of minus infinity to infinity, this question is not well posed. It's not well posed because e to the minus j omega t is not like a regular exponential in the sense that if there was no j there, so there was no complex number, then yeah, sure, we could evaluate it at infinity, right? e to the minus infinity is, uh, is zero. But as soon as you start including um, this co uh, complex j here to make it a complex exponential, you have to think of e to the j omega as really being some sort of sinusoid. And so it doesn't really make sense to consider a sinusoid over infinite time because it's not really convergent, right, to, in, in any way. So in this particular case, it's actually not really going to help us answer this question by integrating, by actually going and plug and chug. So this is not going to work. This sort of strategy is not going to work. So instead, what we're going to do is I'm going to cross this out. And we're just going to look at this integral and stare at it for a moment. So if I look at this integral, what is it saying intuitively? Well, it's saying that I'm going to sum up all the complex exponentials over time, right? all of e to the minus j omega t for multiple time sweeps. So what is e to the j omega t at an individual time point? Well, at an individual time point, this e to the minus j omega t is simply a complex number. And so a complex number, especially in this form, can be plotted in terms of a phasor diagram. So in this particular case, if I have, let's say, one particular e to the minus j omega t, that'll be right around here. All right, this is something that we learned about when talking about complex numbers earlier. You have some sort of phase term. And as we start sweeping different time points, this sort of phase term is going to go round and round. So if I increase time, I'm going to start actually having a complex exponential start rotating. So I'm going to be adding up different sort of complex exponentials that all have the same magnitude. They all have the same length of 1. So I'm going to keep doing this. And as time goes to infinity, uh, from minus infinity to infinity, I'm just going to keep going around this, this wheel, just sort of sweeping around this wheel for a really, really, really long period of time, for an infinite pe period of time, actually. And so if I really do that, uh, and you add up all these uh, sort of vectors, remember that in, these, in this complex plane, these are really vectors. So for example, if I want to add two complex numbers, like you know, one complex number is here, another complex number is here, 
and I want to add them, the addition is going to actually just follow from vector addition, right? You're going to do your tip to tail, and you'll get a complex number that's over here. So we can think of adding these complex exponentials as just adding vectors. And so if I have these vectors that are uniformly distributed uh, around this sort of circle, then hopefully it's clear that if I add these, exponential resultant is zero. So this integral effectively equals zero. Now, this integral, if it has this complex exponential, equals zero. But there's another edge case that we need to consider. And that edge case is what happens if omega is equal to zero. If omega is equal to zero, then this integral so it's zero if omega is not equal to zero and if omega is equal to zero then effectively it's the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus j omega t um, is what e to the minus j omega t is one, right, dt. That's what this integral is. And by convention, because we're talking about a complex exponential, we're actually going to integrate this from 0 to 2 pi. The reason we're going to do that is because e to the minus j omega t is a harmonic. I only need to consider it over 0 to 2 pi. So in particular, these both uh, in this purple case, in this purple case, when I look at this rotation, I only need to look at a rotation over 2 pi because it's periodic. Similarly, when we set omega equal to 0, we also have to consider it in terms of 2 pi periodic. So if omega is equal to 0, then I'm going to have this integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 dt, and this is going to equal 2 pi. So in this particular case, what I actually have is that the Fourier transform of this complex exponential is nothing but a delta function. It's actually a Dirac delta function. Okay, It's a Dirac delta function because it's zero everywhere, right? except for when omega is equal to zero. So I'm going to have a delta term here. So the Fourier transform of one is going to equal a delta. And by convention, this is just by convention, we scale it by 2 pi. Now, different authors will have different scaling terms. But for our definition of a Fourier transform, in order to get back one, so, so, so in order to sort of get back, if I take the inverse Fourier transform of this, I want to get back to one. Remember that my inverse Fourier transform has a division by 2 pi which is why I have this factor of 2 pi here, OK? So the answer to this check your understanding question actually is that the Fourier transform of 1 is 2 pi times delta of omega. This is actually a very hard question. It was a deceptively simple question, but it's actually quite a difficult one. Uh, you cannot consider an integral. You have to actually visualize what the integral is telling you. It's telling you that any complex exponential, e to the j omega, if I'm going to sweep across all, free, all you know, time points, I'm going to be rotating infinitely many times around a circle. right? And the addition of all of these is going to be 0. So the only way that I have any energy in this integral is if the complex exponential goes away in the trivial case where omega equals 0. OK. So, you know, by now we have this data bank of Fourier transforms that we're building up. So here are a few other Fourier transforms that we have. Uh, here, for example, is the one we just discussed, right? The Fourier transform was 1 is 2 pi times delta. And there are various other Fourier transforms here that might be helpful to look at. 
So let's jump right in to another check your understanding question. So suppose I was to ask you, what is the Fourier transform of the Hebicide step function? So feel free to go ahead and try to compute it on your own and see if there's some similarities with the Fourier transform that we just did earlier. So feel free to pause the video and rejoin us on the flip side. Okay, welcome back. So let's look at the answer. Well, the first thing is we're gonna be taking the four transform. So let's use our script notation for transform of U of T. Now the four transform of U of T is gonna equal, and I'll use that same color just for clarity here. We'll use purple. Is gonna equal the integral of from minus infinity to infinity of the function I'm taking the four transform of times e to the minus j omega t dt. Now the step function, Hebicide step function, allows us to simplify the limits of this from zero to infinity, right? Because it, it's one only when it's positive, time is positive, and zero otherwise. So this integral just becomes e to the minus j omega t dt. All right, so now this should look very familiar to that previous problem. So let's again, look at how we would evaluate this. And so many of you would have gotten e to the minus j omega t over minus j omega evaluated from zero to infinity. So we can already see that there are a lot of problems here. This integral doesn't converge. If for example, I put in infinity for time, then what I'm actually effectively getting is I'm getting uh, zero divided by minus infinity. If I put in zero for time, then I'm getting uh, effectively, you know, if I, if I put in zero for time, that's when I'm kind of okay. But if I put in infinity for time, it doesn't converge. So um, because of this infinity, it doesn't converge. So we're going to introduce an, uh, a solution to this problem. So we still want to take the Fourier transform of step function. We don't want to lose that ability. So we're going to introduce a new idea here. Which is called limiting Fourier transforms. At a high level, we're going to use limit theory to find an approximation to the step function and that approximation to the step function will, in terms of a limit, converge to the step function. Let me go through some slides that make this more concrete. So when the Fourier transform integral doesn't converge, and there's no trick we can use, like remember for the one case, we had that intuitive trick about graphically looking at the vector space um, in the beginning of this lecture, then an alternate approach that you can still use if this Fourier transform is being really persistent is to use a limiting Fourier transform. So what we do is we represent the signal as a limit of a sequence of signals for which the Fourier transforms do exist. So in this particular case, let's consider F subscript N of T. F subscript N of T could be, for example, N would be a parameter of the function, like a constant in the function. And we're going to take, you know, Fourier transforms of successive successive iterations of this function for which we can actually evaluate. Now, let's go back to our example of the step function. So we want to consider the Fourier transform of, let's say, a very related function, which is the sine function of t. Okay, the sine function of t looks like this in the time domain. So I have time, 
And the sine function of t is minus one here, and it's plus one here. Okay. And then at zero, we just define it to be zero. So this function, like the step function, and feel free to check it on your own, but this function, like the step function, does not have a clean integral. And so since this doesn't have a clean integral, what we can try to do is we can try to approximate this function with another function. And we're gonna approximate this function with, for example, uh, the causal exponential, which we have learned of before. So let's look at the causal exponential. The causal exponential looks something like this. Right? Remember that this was e to the minus a t for some constant a times the step function u of t. And so this looks something like this. Now, if I take a look at the right-hand side of the sine function, you can see that it's actually quite similar to the causal exponential. Uh, in particular, if I adjust the decay rate, I can, I'm actually gonna get close to the causal, uh, to the sine function. So we've talked about the positive part of the sine function. We can also use the same definition for the negative part of the sine function. So what we're gonna do is, this is gonna be your positive part here. And this is gonna be your negative part of the sine function. So feel free to check this on your own, but this negative part of sine function has this graph, okay? And we're gonna add these two signals together. So we're gonna add these two signals together to give you f sub a of t, which is an approximation to the sine function using causal exponentials that are parametrized by some constant a. So that constant is pretty critical because if we start changing the decay rate, if I, for example, lower the decay rate uh, to, you know, one fifth. So here is a equals one. Here is, I'm gonna lower it by five times. Here's one fifth. And then in blue, I'm gonna have one tenth. So as I start lowering the decay rate, I get closer and closer to the sine function. So it's reasonable to say that when a is actually equal to, you know, approaches zero, at, at, as that limit approaches zero, then f sub a of t approaches sine of t. All right. Now, as we ha probably have known from previous lectures, the causal exponential does have a Fourier transform. So we can compute the Fourier transform, f capital F sub a of j omega, of successive series of f a of t, and then take the limit of the Fourier transform as a approaches zero. So here's the mechanics. The first goal in, for the purpose of this slide, the zeroth goal is on the previous slides, which is to find an FA of T that approximates uh, you know, the function that in question that you're trying to solve for. Once you have the zeroth goal identified, your first goal is to compute f a of j omega. Okay. So f a of j omega is shown here. And then the computation steps, just mechanically, we won't go through them in lecture. But I'm going to plug in that approximation to the sine function and then take the Fourier transform to actually obtain this. Now, as you can see, uh, it has an a term here. And the idea is that uh, the sine function approximates the step function or the, uh, the causal exponentials approximate the sine function when a is zero. So therefore we should be also able to take a to zero in the Fourier transform. So that's your second goal. Compute f a of j omega when a approaches zero. And we show that right here. And all we need to do in this particular case, it's a very simple limit to evaluate. We just put in zero for a, and we end up getting this answer here, two over j omega. And recall also, just as a side note, that one over j equals minus j. Okay, 
So the using these properties and principles, we can state that the Fourier transform of the sine function is two over j omega for omega not equal to zero. Okay. One of the reasons that uh, we need to break it into piecewise is because we have omega in the denominator. So there are a lot of ways to show that when omega equals zero, that the sine function equals zero. But one of the simplest ways to do that is to realize that omega is the DC component. It's the average of the function. What is the average of the sine function? The average of the sine function is zero. So that kind of gives us this line. So this line we, we went through in the previous slides. And then note the DC component. OK. Cool. So similarly, we can analyze what the Fourier transform of a step function is. The step function can be written in terms of the sine function as shown in this equation here. The step function is 1 half plus 1 half times the sine function. Feel free to pause the video and check that on your own if, if that helps. So in this particular case, I can simply take the Fourier transform of u of t. Now notice that uh, if I take the Fourier transform, I can start using my properties of Fourier transforms, right? So I have linearity. So I can separately take the Fourier transform of 1 half and separately the Fourier transform of 1 half times sine of t. And using both homogeneity and superposition, I actually am able to pretty easily simplify that um, to pi delta plus 1 over j omega. So remember that the second term is 0 when omega equals 0. So the spectrum of u of t is pi times delta at omega equals 0. So therefore, you can write that the Fourier transform of the step function, putting it together, equals the following. OK, very good. So now we have just added a couple other Fourier transform pairs to our table and shown how, that we, how we've gotten them. Now, let's go through an example of taking the Fourier transform of an integral. And I'm going to write it by hand. And I'm also going to have a separate slide on this right afterwards. So the Fourier transform of an integral is as follows, right? I have my script f, and I want to take the Fourier transform of some integrated function from minus infinity up until t, f of t, dt. Okay. So we're going to use another property from the previous lecture to sort of prove the, the Fourier transform of the integral, to obtain the Fourier transform of the integral. The Fourier transform of the integral, um, in this particular case, recall that if I integrate a function from minus infinity to t, that's effectively like um, convolving the function with the step function, right? Okay, so this is a previous relation that we learned in one of the earlier lectures. Now, Hopefully, uh, for some of you, it's become apparent that uh, if I'm taking the Fourier transform of a convolution, then that's the multiplication of the individual Fourier transforms, right? Uh, this signal right here, this is sort of still in the time domain. And we know that convolution in time is multiplication and frequency. Therefore, we can write the following. And remember that in this particular case, we know that the Fourier transform of f of t is just some capital F of j omega. And the Fourier transform of the step function, well, we just learned that, right? The Fourier transform of the step function is pi times delta omega plus 1 over j omega. And this is equal to pi 
times f of zero, delta of omega, plus f of j omega over j omega. And all I've done to get from here to here is I've simply applied a distributive property. And since f of j omega is multiplying a delta, the delta is going to be zero everywhere except omega equals zero. So I only need to evaluate the Fourier transform at the DC component. All right. So uh, I may have forgotten to put the slide of this here. So I may have forgotten the slide, but I'll put it up later if need be. But it's exactly the same computation, right? It's exactly the same computation, just written in LaTeX. So NA. All right. So now we have um, talked about some properties of Fourier transforms. So here, just as a review, are some properties. One of the ones that I'll ask you to sort of keep in mind for this lecture is the derivative property. So we've learned uh, some properties of Fourier transforms. We have used several of them in the past few slides, right? I can already see that we've used linearity, convolution. We're going to be using derivative and duality in today's lecture. Um, so there's a lot of these properties. And we also now have compiled up a, a database, a nice healthy database of Fourier transform pairs. Uh, we may not have proven all of them in class, but we have definitely gone through some of them and shown creative ways to solve them. Now we're going to move on to the next segment of the lecture. Uh, this is a very exciting segment. This is a very important segment. So I'll just put star here. So the frequency response, uh, the whole exercise here um, is to think in terms of time domain and frequency domain and both mathematically sort of do what's easier in one domain versus the other, and also intuitively understand uh, systems and circuits and uh, real world you know, cameras and microphones and audio uh, using this fundamental theory. So previously, we discussed this impulse response, which is in time domain. When the output of us, uh, when, when I put in an impulse uh, to the system as the input, like delta of t, uh, so x takes on the form of delta, and then we get back the output y. That's the impulse response for the specific case that x is a delta. The whole key of this exercise was to show that h of t, which is the impulse response, was characteristic of any LTI system. It allows us to calculate the output of any LTI system. Uh, so this output is kind of this, this equation here, which is a convolution. And although this we have now a closed form equation to give us the input and output pairs. The problem is that sometimes it can be difficult to evaluate this integral as you've seen on homeworks, but especially in real world problems, uh, it can be even harder to evaluate this integral. So how can we get around actually going and evaluating this convolution integral, but still characterizing the input and output of LTI systems? Well, the answer is to recast this problem into the realm of the frequency domain. So one way to do that is to simply take the convolution theorem of both sides, right? We know that y equals x of t convolve with h of t. So convolution in the time domain is multiplication in the frequency domain, as we've learned. So therefore, we can just take this exact same equation, apply the convolution theorem, and that brings us right here. So that brings us to a multiplication in the frequency domain. Now, in this particular case, capital X is the Fourier transform of the input, capital Y is the Fourier transform of the output, and here's the important kicker, right? Capital H is the Fourier transform of the impulse response. Now, just like the impulse response has a special name, the Fourier transform of the impulse response also has a special name. It's called the frequency response or the transfer function of the system. 
All right. So it might help if we just go through a concrete example. Many of you will be familiar with this from one of your uh, high school or introductory double E classes. Let's just diagram out an RC circuit. So let's say I have a ground here and uh, it goes through some voltage source B. Let's write a little meter. And um, you know maybe we have some resistor here and we have an output terminal terminal here and then we have a capacitor here and we're going to ground that okay so this output is going to be y of t and the input is going to be right here taken at this terminal x of t right so the input is x of t. So in this particular case, we know from Ohm's law that x minus y is going to equal the current. So there's going to be a current here, right? So I have some current i going in. It's going to be the current times the resistance. And in this particular case, we also know that the current is going to be equal to the capacitance times the first derivative of y. Therefore, x minus y is going to be equal to, just by substituting equations 1 and 2, it's going to be equal to dy dt times r times c. Right, this is your basic RC circuit. And one way to solve this, this is a differential equation. And you can solve this through time domain differential equations. So you can take a differential equations class and they will tell you how to solve these types of equations. And that's great. But sometimes you'll have more complicated circuits for which it's very difficult to get the um, solution to differential equations. And so we can actually use a shortcut here for this particular problem. If we know about Fourier transforms, that'll actually allow us, uh, enable us to calculate the Fourier trans, uh, the sort of output in a different way. So in particular, let's say that this system, uh, the circuit system here, uh, can be characterized by a frequency response. So X of T could be any signal, right? Could be, uh, in this particular case, it's not like high school physics where I just have a nine volt battery going in. In this particular case, I can have an AC uh, voltage source, right? Or I could even have a more complicated waveform going in for the voltage. And so in that particular case, X of T is truly a signal. It's truly a time domain function. And therefore, x of t is going to have also a capital X of j omega. It's going to have a Fourier transform, right? So, you know, in high school, when I at least you know when I was in high school, we went through the same circuit, but we had like a DC voltage. We had just like a nine volt x of t. Now, in this particular case, x of t could be anything. It could be a sinusoid. It could be a square wave. It could be something that doesn't even have to have a periodic pattern in that same manner. So. The key here is that X of T could be flexible, but one thing we do know is that it's a signal, and a signal is going to have a capital X of J omega. Y of T, similarly, is going to also have a capital Y of J omega. So in this particular case, there's going to be a Y and there's going to be an X. And what, if you rearrange the LTI system on the previous slide, you'll see that the transfer function, h of j omega, is simply going to be the ratio of y of j omega divided by x of j omega. Okay. So now, as an exercise, we'll have a few slides on this. So as an exercise, let's set our first goal to calculate J omega 
or the circuit diagram above. Okay, so how do I do this? Well, one way to do this is I have this equation here, which gives me uh, an X and a Y and the relationship between them. So I can just simply start by taking the Fourier transform of both, both sides. All right, and that's gonna instantly get me So we're going to be converting this, right? That's effectively what we're doing. So X minus Y becomes just by linearity, capital X of J omega minus capital Y of J omega. And now we have to take the Fourier transform of the right-hand side. So what we're doing is we're taking the Fourier transform of the left-hand side and the Fourier transform of the right-hand side. And by linearity, we have on the left-hand side, just capital X minus capital Y. And for the right-hand side, what we have is we actually have, uh, well, we have to take the Fourier transform of dy dt times r times c. Okay. In this particular case, r and c are constants. They're going to go out of the Fourier transform integral. So you're actually effectively going to have to calculate really the Fourier transform of dy dt. Okay. So this is going to equal Fourier transform of dy dt times rc. So the Fourier transform of dy dt is actually going to equal j omega y of j omega. Let me just uh, write this in the corner here. Fourier transform of dy dt is going to equal j omega times capital Y of omega, j omega. Oops. Right? Why does this hold? Well, this holds by just uh, one of the properties of the Fourier transform is if I know the Fourier transform of Y is capital Y, I can get a simple relationship for the derivative of the Fourier transform. So that was one of the properties is the derivative of the Fourier transform. So if I apply the derivative property uh, on the top left here, then I'm simply going to get J omega Y of J omega times RC. Right. So now what I can do is I can go ahead and divide both sides. I, I can subtract Y, I can do some algebra, and I can isolate X, right? So X of J omega, I'm going to add Y to both the left-hand side. So here is the left-hand side, and here is the right-hand side. And so I'm going to add Y to both sides. So X of J omega equals what? Well, it's going to equal y of j omega of 1 plus j omega rc. Okay. So now I have an expression. And I can simply divide, remember, uh, h of j omega is y divided by x. So in this particular case, I can simply solve for h of j omega as being equal to 1 over 1 plus j omega rc. Okay. And if I wanted to characterize the output, of the system, I know that in the frequency domain, the out output in terms of the frequency domain is y of j omega equals x of j omega or h of j omega times x of j omega. Multiplication is commutative, so it doesn't matter what order, but 
that's effectively how I here I've identified my first goal is to calculate capital H. And once that's done, I can characterize the output capital Y for any arbitrary signal. All right. Now, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to set our second goal. as calculating the magnitude of the transfer function. Remember that h of j omega is a complex number. So let's calculate the magnitude of h of j omega. Right. So remember that h of j omega equals 1 over 1 plus j omega rc. This is equal to 1 over 1 plus j omega rc multiplied by, I'm going to just multiply this by 1. And so one trick that you can use when trying to simplify these uh, fractional forms where you have a 1 over it is to simply multiply by um, the, essentially the conjugate, right? So 1 minus j omega rc over 1 minus j omega rc, right? This is just multiplication by 1, so it's totally valid. And this is going to equal 1 minus j omega rc divided by 1 plus omega squared r squared c squared, right? So what this does is it just gets it into an easier form for us to manipulate. Why is that? Because now if I look at this equation, this equation is in the form of a plus bj. So previously, I had the j in the denominator right here. And it was kind of difficult to identify what is the real part and what is the complex part. Now, even though this is kind of seems more complicated, it's actually simpler because I have a real part, which is 1 over the denominator. And I have a complex part, which is minus omega rc over the denominator. Okay, so I've gotten into this form. So the reason you want to get into this form is if you want to calculate uh, the magnitude, remember that the magnitude right, the square of the magnitude is going to equal h of j omega multiplied by h conjugate of j omega. And that's why it's really useful to separate it out. So now if I just continue along this line, if I want to simplify this, this is going to equal 1 minus um, j omega rc divided by 1 plus omega squared r squared c squared. So all I've done is I've just taken this equation right here, right, and plug that in for h of j omega. Now, if I want to look at the conjugate of this, well, the conjugate is just simply going to be um, with the sign, uh, sign swapped right on the complex portion. So the complex portion now would have the opposing sign. So it'd be 1 plus j omega rc over 1 plus omega squared r squared c squared. And so this is h of j omega times h star of j omega. And if I simply continue with the simplification, I end up with 1 plus omega squared r squared c squared divided by 1 plus omega squared r squared c squared whole squared. And this equals 1 over 1 plus omega squared r squared c squared. Let me just write this a little neater. All right. So now if I want to calculate, you know, and solve for my goal here, our goal was to calculate h of j omega, this magnitude. That is nothing but the square root of the above. And so that answer is going to be the square root of 1 is 1 divided by the square root 
of 1 plus omega squared r squared c squared. And so that is your answer for the magnitude of h. All right, so now that I have the magnitude of h, how does that help us? So let me go to a clean slide here. So let me just rewrite the magnitude. h of j omega equals 1 over square root of 1 plus omega squared r squared c squared. And so remember that we were dealing with this particular problem where I have a ground and I have a voltage source. So here's your x. And then I have a resistor up here. And then I have a capacitor. And then I have a ground. And here's your y. And so we were looking at if I put in an x, some arbitrary waveform, what can I say about the output that I get? So we know that in this particular case, the output, the magnitude of the output, y of j omega equals h of j omega times x of j omega. So this follows because remember y equals hx. And then if I take the magnitude of both sides, this is what I get because the absolute value sign has that property that the absolute value of AB equals the absolute value of A times the absolute value of B. So I've just applied that to get to the right-hand side here. So what this is saying is that the magnitude of some frequency omega in my output is gonna be the input magnitude of that frequency scaled by the magnitude of the transfer function at that frequency. This will become more clear as we go along in the lecture, but let's go through a concrete example now. So let's say we have, uh, we're gonna put in sinusoids for the voltage source, V. And so the sinusoids could be, for example, low frequencies. So I might put in a low frequency sinusoid, which means that omega is much less, less than, less than one over RC. And so in this particular case, you're gonna end up with, uh, let's calculate this. So if omega is super, super, super small, right? Effectively, omega squared R squared C squared is zero. So H of J omega is one over square root of one. So H of J omega is approximately one. So what that means is if I have a sine wave that is a very, very low frequency, let's draw it out. Here's your sine wave. This is your input sine wave. If I put in this input sine wave, here I'll just draw it in blue. Here's your x. Then the output that you get, y, which is in red here, is going to be pretty much the same thing. Okay, you can get the same thing, input and then output. Now, uh, in contrast, let's say we're in the regime of moderate frequencies. So in this particular case, omega equals one over RC, right? Omega is approximately here. And so H of J omega is gonna equal one over the square root of two. So once again, we can draw our diagram of input and output. So I'm gonna, again, put in the exact same thing. I'm gonna put in this sine wave. But this time, the output that I get is gonna be dampened. It's gonna be lower amplitude sine wave. And in particular, this amplitude is gonna be downscaled or scaled by one over square root of two, right? Now, we might consider a third regime, which is like super high frequencies. So at high frequencies, omega is much greater than one over RC. So if omega is much, much greater than one over RC, then H of J omega is small and it really approaches zero right, when these are super high. So now 
if I send, for example, a higher frequency sinusoid into the signal, into the system. So let's send a very high frequency sinusoid. So I send this in and I'm gonna get effectively nothing as the output. And this is why capacitors are used in circuits to denoise unwanted noise, like high frequency noise from power lines or disturbances because of this property. All right, just one quick note here. In the moderate frequencies, if I look at these two, I made kind of an error while I was writing. I drew the sinusoids at the same frequency. However, those of you with a keen eye, you'll notice that this should actually be a slightly higher frequency to illustrate the concept. So I have a slightly higher frequency here. And then I'm also going to, so I have a slightly higher frequency and this is gonna be downscaled. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, one way this is used is in power lines, you wanna eliminate noise. You could have, for example, uh, some other noise coming in some other noise from somewhere else coming in. And usually this noise uh, very often will have a high frequency. And so by putting this capacitor there, you're gonna atten attenuate that noise from your output. Another way this, is, this RC circuit is used in the frequency analysis is um, sort of when it comes down to the AM radio modulation that we talked about earlier. So in the AM radio modulation, Remember that we had this uh, AM radio that was carrying a signal of interest. Let's say the signal of interest is some signal M of T that I wanna pick up, but this signal M of P T is being carried on a high frequency sine wave. Why is that? Because high frequency sine waves propagate nicely through the air. Okay, so they have nice properties. So it's being carried on this high frequency sine wave so I'm really sending M of T times cosine of omega naught T. And so now when I receive the signal at my receiver, so this signal propagates through the world and I get it at my receiver, I want to actually apply a low pass filter. So I put it through an RC circuit. Why is that? Because I don't want the carrier signal, I don't want the red portion, I just want in this particular case, nice clean M of T. And that's what I get. And by the way, in this particular example, I can also have another, you know, M, let's say, let's just, you know, draw another uh, signal here. I can also have like an M tilde of T, uh, which is running at a different frequency, right? This could be running at a much higher frequency, right? Much higher frequency. Uh, this could be modulated by cosine omega 1t. So this would be like a different radio station. So that was the AM radio example that we talked about earlier. All right. So um, as I mentioned, capital H is called the transfer function of the system as well. And one of the things it tells you is it tells you how the input is changed at every frequency. So if I have a system, I characterize the impulse response and then I characterize a Fourier transform of the impulse response, which is the transfer function, then what that's telling me is how is my system gonna behave if I put in signals of different frequencies? Uh, one example is your ear intuitively. If I, if I were to look at the biology of my ear and take measurements and understand the impulse response, then I could take the Fourier transform of that. And what you would see is that the Fourier transform uh, the magnitude of that would start to be zero at high values of omega, values of omega that were above 20,000 hertz in the ultrasound range. Why is this? Because humans don't hear in this range, right? So the transducer, which is our cochlea and our bones there, that is not going to pass 20,000 hertz sinusoids, right? Um, so in general, there's a lot of these, these intuitive examples, but in general, what you should take away is that the output, the Fourier transform, so the amount of sinusoid omega 
right? The magnitude of sinusoid omega, let's say this is the omega i, right? The magnitude of this ith omega is how much of the ith omega frequency you put in for x scaled by how well your system will actually pass that ith frequency omega. That's what this is saying. And this equation is simply a multiplication of magnitudes. Now, this is in the amplitude spectrum. But we may also be interested in understanding the phase spectrum, right? How is the phase spectrum changed? And it turns out that the phase spectrum is additive. Uh, you can just see this by elementary properties. Like when you multiply two complex numbers, you're multiplying their magnitudes, but adding their phases. So in this particular case, you're actually adding a phase of whatever the angle of the, the, the phase response is of your system. Okay, so uh, one way that you can really intuitively see this is to put in a complex exponential into the system. Uh, we kind of went through this in one of the very early lectures where uh, if I want to put in a complex exponential uh, to the system, let's say x of t in this particular case is going to equal this, right? It's going to equal e to the j omega naught t. And therefore, if that's x of t, then I can take capital X of omega, capital X of j omega, as being its Fourier transform, which is going to be nothing but, uh, in this particular case, 2 pi times a delta shifted to uh, omega naught. So it follows that since y of t equals x convolved with h of t, it follows that y of j omega equals x of j omega times h of j omega. And so from that, you can actually calculate uh, capital Y of j omega using this equation. Right? So I've just plugged in the value that I calculated here for capital X and simply plug that into the equation. What this means is that if I want to actually calculate um, the output, what my output lowercase y looks like, I can take the inverse Fourier transform of capital Y, and this is effectively what I get. So you'll see that this is a very similar equation uh, to what we saw in, um, in one of the earlier lectures, where the amplitude of the complex exponential is going to be defined as the magnitude of the transfer function, and the phase shift of that complex exponential it's going to be defined as the angle of the transfer function. So one application for this is in tuning circuits, right? Uh, if I want to understand the behavior of my circuits, make sure it's, it's picking up the right frequencies, make sure it's canceling the right frequencies, amplifying certain frequencies, and so on. Uh, so one pr tool that people have is something called a spectrum analyzer. This is a very expensive device, uh, but you do have them in EE labs and, and large companies. You know, good spectrum analyzers can, can especially over a large, large frequency range, can cost about $100,000. Um, so it's a big capital expense. But what this allows you to do is it allows you to, uh, on the x-axis, take frequencies and understand how much they're attenuated by. So for example, here, I have, I'll just load up because it's kind of hard to see. This is right here about 10 kilohertz. Right here, I have 100 kilohertz. Uh, and then over here, right about here, I have 400 kilohertz. And above here, I have a megahertz. So what's, what this figure is showing is there are two plots here. Um, one plot is shown here is this one right here. Should really be colored per pink. And this is the angle of H of J omega, right? It's how much it changes uh, the face. And this plot here in green 
right here. This plot is effectively uh, the magnitude h of j omega, all right? So what it's saying is that the magnitude of h of j omega is highest here. And so what this system is doing, it might be a, a particular circuit, but this circuit, what it's doing is it's really just picking up signals at 400 kilohertz and passing them through. And signals that are at other frequencies are attenuated. They're attenuated much more. All right, so here's an example. Let's say that you're given an input. X of t equals you know, this, this summation of three cosines. And this input is going to be passed through a system with an impulse response of a sinc squared. Now, the question for you is, what is the output of this? Well, one way to do that is to simply convolve x of t and h of t. But that's going to be a little bit difficult to do. So what if we could use some of what we've learned with Fourier transforms to compute this example? So as it turns out, here's what you can do. So first of all, remember that h of j omega equals the Fourier transform of h of t, right? So in this particular case, what I can simply do is I can take the Fourier transform of h of t. And we know from our table of Fourier transforms it's in the catalog, right, of Fourier transforms. Sinc squared of t is going to have a Fourier transform that is delta, that is the triangle of omega over 2 pi. Now, it turns out that we can simplify this to sinc squared of t over pi, which is going to have a Fourier transform of pi. I need to get this to t over pi in the argument because that's what the impulse response has. It's going to equal pi times the triangle function, omega over 2 pi times 1 over 1 plus pi. 1 over. 1 over pi. And this is going to equal pi times the triangle. So the pi is going to go away. So it's going to be omega over 2. And so here, we got to this step by applying the property. f of at has a Fourier transform pair. That is 1 over a times f of j omega over a. OK, so now we have taken the Fourier transform of h. We've taken the Fourier transform of the impulse response. And this is also known as the transfer function or frequency response. So now I can simply um, plug in uh, the, the Fourier transform of x and then multiply the two, right? So h of j omega is going to equal 2 times the triangle of omega over 2, right? Because we're scaling by 2 pi here. So all these calculations here are covered here. So this gives you uh, the transfer function of your system. And we know that the output that we want to get to, right, we want to get the output. So let's put the output in red here. So the, at least in the frequency domain, the output is going to equal h of j omega times x of j omega. And x of j omega, capital X of j omega, that one is pretty easy to calculate, right? Because it's just cosines. So if it's just cosines, it's just going to be a sum of Dirac's. In particular, I'm going to get 2 pi times delta omega minus 1 plus delta omega plus 1 plus 3 pi uh, 
delta omega minus 1.5, right, because the three halves. plus delta omega plus 1.5 plus pi times delta omega minus two plus delta omega plus two, all right? So now what I can do is I can simply look at this in the frequency domain. I can plot this, right? So here is H that we calculated. So H of J omega is gonna equal uh, two times delta of omega over two, right? That's what we calculated before. And then we're gonna be multiplying that by this, uh, this three Dirac system um, for X, right? This was X of T. And now it's x of j omega. So if I just multiply this in the frequency domain, we can immediately see that if I even if I just cover this up, so just cover this up, you immediately know that y is just going to be made up of spikes. Why is that? Because this is all zeros, right? These are all zeros here. So no matter what I multiply x with, I'm still going to get spikes, or you know, or a subset of spikes. And so in particular, that's what I actually see, right? So the spikes at minus two are not, and two are not passed because this frequency response is zero here, but these other two spikes are passed. And it turns out that this spike is pretty highly attenuated, the spike at 1.5. So actually when I look at Y, Y is actually uh, more heavily made up of minus one and one, spikes at, at a frequency of one as opposed to spikes at a frequency of 1.5. So what this has shown is that your transfer function has adjusted the frequencies that are present in your signal, and this gives you Y of J omega. All right, so now if you actually compute this, you'll see that